Okay, so uh, now we're going to talk about uh, the idea of life in the universe. And of course, the only place where we really know of life in the universe and what we know most about life is on this planet. So we define life as uh, so, uh, there, there are four basic, um, at least your book is using, four di basic properties that all living things uh, will have. And you may find some non-living things that will share some of these, but not all four of them. Uh, one is the ability to react with one's environment. Uh, and, and for instance, uh, if an organism is, uh, is uh, damaged, it can heal itself. Uh, the second one is growth by taking in nourishment from the surroundings. The third is reproduction. And the fourth, which, uh, and we could probably find some non-living things that will do the uh, first three, but the fourth one is uh, capacity uh, for genetic change. Uh, which is to say evolution. People that want to make a case for the possibility or let's say probability of extraterrestrial life, uh, it's based on uh, assumptions that are known as the assumptions of mediocrity. And that is these four points. That life on Earth depends on uh, a relatively uh, uh, small number of basic molecules. There's about 1,500 molecules uh, roughly that, that, that most living things are using. The elements, the second thing is the elements that make up the, uh, these molecules can be found everywhere in the universe. So this is a, a, a fundamental tenet of uh, astrochemistry and certainly what everything that we've been uh, discussing so far would indicate that we'd expect to find all the elements everywhere. Maybe some at lower concentrations or higher concentrations, but everything is, is going to be everywhere in the universe. Uh, and the third one, which is a very important one, uh, which I think we could all agree on, is that the laws of science uh, must be the same, must be universal laws. That is, they must be the same everywhere. Now, the fourth one is a very, very uh, speculative one, I would say, and that is that given enough time, what happened here on Earth would happen somewhere else in the universe, and that's the part that uh, I think many of us could uh, take issue with. But let's go back uh, to a billion years ago. Uh, uh, when the Earth's surface was uh, very, very violent, and uh, even beyond a, b a billion years ago, uh, there was a lot of uh, there was radioactivity, which there still is lightning, a lot of volcanism, uh, ultraviolet radiation was uh, pummeling the Earth. Uh, there wasn't really a protective uh, layer to absorb that, and there was a lot more uh, meteoritic impact at that time, uh, uh, also early on in the Earth's history. Uh, the energy from some of these events was actually uh, sufficient to, to perhaps create the first organic uh, molecules. And uh, it, to kind of simulate these conditions, in 1953, um, Stanley Miller, who was a, um, a graduate student of Harold uh, Urey's, and I, I think this was at the University of Chicago, but I don't really remember, uh, constructed a, uh, a rather simple device that looks something like this. It was basically a flask. What he did was he filled this with water and uh, he uh, had over here through his inlet he was putting in a mixture of uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, and uh, methane. So these are four gases that were introduced into this chamber here. Now his water he's heated to boiling so steam comes up here, goes into here, so now the fourth component is actually water vapor. And after a period of days or maybe perhaps a week or so, um, down in the trap here, he's collected uh, water. So the water that's down here, some of the water will return, but the water that's down in here is actually, uh, when it's analyzed, it's actually found to contain amino acids. So that is from completely inorganic uh, materials, uh, we can now isolate uh, materials, chemicals that are alpha amino acids. And we know that these amino acids um, are things that are going to be required if you're going to have life. The simplest amino acid is amino acetic acid, where the R group over here is hydrogen, so it's NH2, CH2, CO2H, and that's the amino acid glycine. And for instance, you could also have an R as an example that is a methyl group, a CH3 three group up here. So this is R equals uh, H, 
and if R is equal to CH3, uh, then the amino acid is uh, alanine. Now, all he got were a bunch of various uh, simple amino acids in here, but the idea was, look, you could take um, these kinds of things that probably existed in the atmosphere, or we know that they existed in the atmosphere of primordial uh, Earth. And one of the ways that you can tell that is you can find uh, rocks and date these rocks, uh, some of which are billions of years old, and you can actually date uh, the rock uh, and get a rough idea of, of, of how old the rock is if you can find a gas pocket in that rock and open it up before you actually open it up, if you can drill into it and extract the gas, then you can, what you're doing is you're actually, um, you're actually analyzing whatever the gas happened to have been when that pocket actually formed. Assuming that it's gases like this that haven't reacted, you're still going to see if there was ammonium, carbon dioxide, and methane in there. And that's basically uh, what Miller did uh, when he did this experiment. So he got uh, amino acids, and people got very excited about that because they said, aha, look at this. You can actually get something that we've associated with living things, but you can get it to form in an abiotic uh, way, something that doesn't actually require uh, life. Although, you know, in actuality, uh, although it's not mentioned in your book, almost 100 years prior to that, probably back in the, oh, I think it was a little bit more than 100 years, I think it was in 1848, um, uh, Friedrich uh, Wohler actually took ammonium cyanate, uh, which is this compound, NH4, that's a ammonium ion, and the cyanate is OCN, and this is an inorganic compound. So it's, a, it's an oxygen that has a negative charge on it. It's an oxygen uh, single bonded to a carbon, which is triple bonded to the uh, nitrogen atom. So this ammonium cyanate which is sometimes written as NH4CNO, if you heat it up, uh, Wohler was very, very surprised to find out that it rearranged uh, to this compound, which is called urea. And urea, which is actually a constituent of urine, this diamino ketone, 2NH2 is bonded to a carbonyl, to a C double bond O, and uh, this, this, this again is an example of taking something that is inorganic and making something organic out of it. But this was a little bit, maybe a little bit more interesting because we're starting out with some very, very simple molecules, ammonia, carbon dioxide, and methane, the things that were actually pre present in a primordial uh, Earth atmosphere. And by doing this kind of thing, uh, he was able to make uh, amino acids. Uh, after that, uh, other experiments were tried. Uh, and uh, one thing that's not shown in your book, another thing is that if you take uh, hydrogen cyanide, which is a highly uh, toxic gas, panamer of hydrogen cyanide. Five hydrogen cyanide uh, molecules will actually combine to form this interesting looking uh, compound, which is known as a purine, this particular ring system. And this particular one, this amino purine, uh, actually has the name of adenine. And some of you may recognize this, those of you that have had biology is that this is one of the four base pairs that actually uh, makes up uh, uh, DNA. The A, G, C, and T, the four, four base pair letters that make up uh, DNA. But again, we have an example of a more complex molecule that sort of naturally falls out from a very, very simple molecule. And again, hydrogen cyanide is something that was believed to have uh, existed in the atmosphere of uh, primordial Earth. So that's, again, something that's very, very interesting. Uh, one other thing, which is mentioned in your book, is that amino acids on heating have been shown to organize into microspheres, uh, droplets that can grow and uh, separate from the uh, parent, and I use the word parent uh, uh, parenthetically, uh, or, in, or in quotation marks, uh, and then they can form individual droplets. Well, that almost sounds like one of the things that we talked about uh, life, you know, uh, the ability to grow and the ability to reproduce. But that's not really what we're seeing. These are just physical uh, changing, the changes that are occurring. Um, also, uh, we've also seen this uh, previously, that in interstellar uh, space, uh, we've seen in interstellar molecular clouds, uh, and they've been shown to have hundreds of these uh, very complex 
uh, uh, molecules uh, or, or to contain those things. And uh, there's been some speculation that even glycine, uh, that very simple amino acid that I showed you before, uh, might, be, might be in there. Uh, water, methanol, ammonia, and, and carbon monoxide exposed to ultraviolet radiation uh, at ice cold temperatures. Uh, it's found that the uh, ice form droplets uh, that are surrounded by membranes containing uh, complex uh, organic materials. But in this particular case, there were no amino acids. Uh, there were nothing uh, that, like these uh, precursors uh, uh, to nucleotides uh, that were actually observed. So uh, chemical evolution uh, is uh, also apparent uh, in a sample of uh, uh, what's called the uh, Murchison uh, meteorite uh, from uh, something that was uh, retrieved in uh, Australia. And uh, there's a little, uh, there's a picture of that in your book as well. And there's a little bit of a, um, uh, like a dark speck in there that is, a, an, uh, that is a, an organic uh, uh, granule that was actually present on this meteorite. And that, me that particular thing actually does uh, show uh, amino acids uh, in it. So, you know, these are all very, very interesting kinds of observations, but what do they really mean, or do they mean anything at all? Uh, because even though uh, we can do, we can show that it's possible to make, um, for instance, amino acids, even something as simple as taking a, uh, making a dipeptide, which is where you take two amino acids, uh, let's take another one over here, COOH, Let's put the alanine that I mentioned before. So this is, uh, we'll put a hydrogen over here and make that uh, glycine. And then over here we'll put a methyl group and make that alanine. And then uh, if we eliminate water between these two molecules, so we're actually going to eliminate water, H2O from here, what we form is what's called a peptide bond. It's a CO, we're gonna lose the OH in one of the hydrogens, and then we're gonna have an NH it's a peptide bond, and this is characteristic of all uh, proteins. There's going to be a bunch of these peptide bonds. So we'll have a one end of the protein. We have what's called the C terminus. That's where the carbonyl or the carboxylic acid end is. And on the other end, uh, now we've got where the that we have a peptide bond here, and uh, then we're going to have another carbon and uh, the methyl group here, and a hydrogen over here, and then we have the N terminus the NH2 group, and that's the amino end of this thing, and this can go longer and longer and longer. Uh, this is a dipeptide, uh, in this case it's alanyl uh, glycine. So these are, um, you know, this is a very, very simple molecule, but in order to actually get something like an enzyme, uh, we, we need something that's, that's a lot bigger than this, that's, a, that's structurally a lot more complex, and the idea that those things could spontaneously form is at least in my opinion, it's a little far-fetched. I mean, you can't rule it out in, in an absolute sense, but it just doesn't seem uh, terribly likely. And we've never been able to make, uh, although we can synthesize those things, these things don't spontaneously form uh, just by taking, we don't even get uh, uh, dipeptides uh, out of these mixtures. We're getting, uh, basically we're getting amino acids. And, and adenine, uh, which is, uh, is, as I say, is a precursor to uh, DNA is not, of course, DNA in and of itself. I mean, even to make what we actually need to, to string together, the unit that we need to string together uh, to make DNA out of this, we have to take the adenine and we have to react it with something called deoxyribose, uh, a sugar. We normally have uh, an OH group over here. I'm going to remove the OH and I'm actually going to form a bond. I'm going to remove the hydrogen and we're going to form a bond uh, with that sugar, and this is the sugar ri uh, deoxy, uh, two prime deoxyribose. Uh, it's got a OH group here, and there's a hydrogen over here. Here's a, here there's a CH2 OH. This forms the, the nucleoside uh, known as adenosine, and this is a nucleoside. It's still not what we need to make DNA. We have to have a nucleotide, so we have to phosphorylate this. We have to put a phosphate group out here. And actually, uh, what I can do then is I can take uh, another molecule similar to this. Um, so as I said, this is, a, this is called adenosine. Well, this is adenylic acid, actually, at this point. This is the, but this is the A, this is the actual A that is going to be making up the, uh, 
uh, one of the four base pairs. So I can combine that, for instance, with, for instance, cytosine, uh, which is going to look like this. If I put that in with cytosine further, but just as I showed you that you could extend amino acids in longer and longer change, chains, now we're going to form a dinucleotide. Uh, so over here, we're going to have a different base pair. And so this is, a, this is a thymidine. So anyway, so we've got thymidine and adenine. We now have a dinucleotide. That is the smallest, it's really not even DNA yet. I mean, it's just two base pairs. So imagine having to do this hundreds, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of times and to get this. And even once we have all these molecules together, that doesn't give us life. You know, scientists are in general agreement of uh, when things, when living things actually arose uh, on the planet. And we know that the earliest things were things like cyanobacteria. And some of these things can be dated back uh, about three and a half billion years ago. And I actually, I don't know if you can see this or not. Uh, I have a small fossil collection that I keep. This uh, kind of amorphous looking rock that I'm showing you right here, and that's a little bit. But this surface that's been polished here uh, is actually showing uh, uh, organisms that are called stromatolites. And these are microscopic organisms. But cyanobacteria, which when they died, they actually formed layers in here. And this, uh, this, this rock, uh, this, these stromatolites are typically, uh, what I'm showing you right here, which is something uh, of, uh, I believe, of Australian origin, uh, these date back about two billion years. So the look, uh, uh, you know, go back maybe uh, uh, some 400, maybe 400 or 450 uh, uh, million years ago, you're getting more complex uh, forms of life. And this is a Precambrian uh, type of fossil. This is, um, this is a trilobite. This is a fossil trilobite right, right alongside. I don't know if you can see the three uh, lobes along here, but that uh, organism, you know, as I say, is uh, something uh, approaching a half a billion years uh, of age. Up here during the Devonian period, here's a uh, fossil fish uh, in shale. Uh, this might be easier to see. You can see the, uh, the fish fossil there. And that's not too bad. Carpo uh, pineus, uh, and this is uh, from the Cretaceous uh, period. This is not a drawing, incidentally. And I don't know if you can see that, but uh, if you can, it's a little out of focus from the way that I'm looking at it. What you're looking at is a shrimp like uh, organism. And you can actually see uh, right over here the tail of the shrimp. This is the head. Let me see if I can show you here. So the head is, uh, is uh, over here where I'm tapping and the tail is uh, over where this, this uh, finger is here. And uh, you know, so that is another uh, very, very old uh, organism. Uh, later on, when uh, arthropods uh, actually formed, uh, here's, a, uh, here's a piece of uh, amber uh, fossil amber, and in this, there is actually, uh, if I can get it out of here, there are these little dark inclusions, which are actually uh, little tiny flies that were trapped uh, in this amber, and this is somewhere between 25 and, and uh, 40 million years ago that these uh, organisms actually became trapped uh, in this amber. So, you know, we can actually see uh, the diversity of life. Uh, on this planet and how it arose at, at uh, different, uh, different points in time. And this is actually the jawbone of a mammal. I don't know what the age of this is and I don't even know what the uh, creature is. But it's not a dinosaur uh, mouth because uh, it's got teeth. This is something that would have probably been an herbivore and it's got the kind of teeth uh, that you would use for grinding. So I don't know if you can see that. But this is uh, a rock type of thing but very much uh, uh, toothy structure to it. So now life in the solar system, on the other hand, if it exists at all, it's gone, it's, uh, there's only uh, a, a relatively small number of uh, places where it could uh, either exist now or could have ever existed. So we know, for instance, in the, zone, in the habitable zone of our own star, of the sun, uh, there's only three planets that would have actually supported life, that, or could have supported life at some point in time. One of them uh, is, uh, uh, is Venus, which we, it, although Venus could at some point in its history have supported life, we know that the conditions on Venus are such that life as we know it could not possibly exist, which doesn't rule out the possibility that um, if we actually uh, uh, 
scoured the surface of Venus that we might not find some uh, fossil evidence of life. And Mars, uh, which is a much better candidate, and you know we've already sent some probes there uh, to look for, uh, uh, for life, but so far uh, haven't really found anything, although uh, one of the things that, that at least what we need know about terrestrial life is that it's going to require water. Uh, we do see evidence uh, not only that there could still be some water uh, on the surface of the planet, uh, but also we see uh, evidence on the surface of Mars that uh, indicates that there at least at some point in its history there must have been a lot of water. And uh, some of the earlier uh, Martian uh, probes, the Viking mission for instance, uh, uh, which was looking for uh, evidence of life, didn't find anything. But, uh, you know, there have been probes that have been sent out and uh, uh, right now, you know, uh, of course we have the uh, Curiosity uh, rover that's uh, on the surface and just very recently, within uh, the last couple of weeks, it found, uh, and uh, I think I've seen a photograph of a pebble, which geologists have looked at this, say that this pebble, this is something that could not have, that could only have formed if it was, if there was flowing water that was actually uh, washing over this thing. So this was, uh, and there's a whole bunch of these pebbles, it's not a unique thing, but it's found a lot of these pebbles that indicate uh, that the area uh, where they were found, that this was a, uh, either a dried uh, stream bed of some sort, uh, but at some point in Mars history there was flowing water there. So there's a lot of uh, uh, evidence for, for water being present in there. But in terms of uh, when we're looking for life, uh, we, 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 we tend to think along the lines of uh, we, what we call life as we know it. If, if we're looking for life, we're looking basically for carbon-based life. Uh, there's a lot of uh, science fiction uh, regarding things like, well, could life be based on silicon, uh, which, is in, which is in the same group, uh, the same chemical group as carbon, has a lot of the same kinds of chemical features as carbon, but the, uh, one of the problems with silicon is that silicon-silicon bonds just do not have the strength of carbon-to-carbon -carbon bonds. So uh, it's very, very hard to make long chains of uh, silicon uh, atoms. They're just very unstable, they fall apart. We can make uh, siloxanes, for instance, which are alternating silicon oxygen bonds. Uh, those are a lot more stable, but that doesn't give us the uh, kind of structural diversity that we need to make uh, to actually generate uh, very, very the kinds of complex structures that we can get out of carbon atoms. So I think it's fairly safe to say my, my own knowledge of organic chemistry and uh, what I know also about silicon chemistry or about the chemistry of any other elements it's probably safe to say that if life exists anywhere else, it's going to be carbon-based life. So I think that's probably uh, something that most uh, scientists would agree on. Uh, there are also, you know, one of the other uh, problems that people have is, uh, you know, so we looked at other places in the solar system, for instance, where there might be life. Uh, we also couldn't roll out uh, things like Europa, uh, the Jovian uh, moon Europa, uh, which we know, even though Jupiter itself and the other Jovian planets uh, have very uh, extraordinarily uh, inhospitable uh, environments. The surface of those planets, um, you know, there really isn't a surface per se. I mean, it's, uh, or if it is, it's, it's frozen, you know, these are frozen ga gases, uh, or, you know, there's a rocky core, but the pressures there would be, uh, are, are absolutely enormous, and we wouldn't expect to see uh, uh, any form of life there. It's been postulated that maybe uh, life could have originated, although it would be certainly a strange form of life, in the atmospheres of uh, some of these planets. Uh, if you go up high enough into the atmosphere, uh, the temperatures are not quite as severe. And uh, the other thing is, though, if we look at the moons like Europa or Saturn's moon Titan, uh, we know that even though there may, I mean, there are areas that seem to contain water. Uh, but, they're, but they're, you know, it's frozen on the surface, it's ice, but below the ice, uh, it's very, there's very probably uh, liquid water. And we already know, because there are many organisms uh, on the Earth, uh, what we refer to as extremophiles, uh, organisms that are able to live in the most inhospitable uh, uh, types of uh, uh, terrestrial environments. So whether we're talking about things that are actually, actually isolated uh, that live at hundreds of degrees Celsius, uh, such as these things that uh, 
uh, these organisms that actually survive uh, down in the depths of the ocean where there are these hot uh, fumaroles that are actually expelling what would be for most forms of life uh, toxic uh, quantities of hydrogen sulfide yet there and there's no light at all yet these organisms uh, do chemosynthesis and are able to uh, instead of doing photosynthesis they're actually able to take the uh, hydrogen sulfide, the sulfides out of the water and actually are able to uh, uh, extract energy and uh, survive at the, under these conditions. And also things that can survive under ex uh, halophilic uh, organisms that, uh, that will survive under extreme concentrations of salt or organisms that survive at extraordinarily low temperatures. We have all these things on the earth. Uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, there might not be if the conditions, uh, if similar conditions existed uh, somewhere else uh, on another uh, planet in the solar system that they might not contain some uh, form of life. But again, uh, you know, this is all highly uh, speculative. And as I said, none of the, uh, the Viking uh, missions or, or any of the other uh, missions that have been sent to uh, Mars so far have e ever found anything that gave us uh, uh, really definitive evidence that there was even some very, very primitive form of life uh, on, uh, on Mars. Drake had come up with this equation to indicate uh, an estimate of the number of, let's say, intelligent uh, civilizations that would exist uh, within our galaxy that would actually be capable of uh, communicating with us. So, so I can read my own handwriting here, uh, although they're all present in your book. So n is the uh, number of uh, civilizations in our galaxy with which communication might be possible. So that's what, what, what Drake is trying to find. Uh, this R star is the rate of star formation uh, per year in the Milky Way. And so this is generally agreed upon by most astronomers that we're getting about 10 uh, stars per year. Uh, these other things, these uh, this uh, F sub P uh, term, I'm sorry, F sub P is the, the fraction of these stars that would actually have planets around them. And this is uh, expressed as a fraction. What the authors of your textbook are saying is that by and large, they think that every single star out there is going to have some planets around it. I mean, we don't know this. I mean, we've looked at, uh, I don't remember uh, what the exact number was. It's probably up to about, we probably found, found evidence so far of maybe uh, a thousand uh, exoplanets and uh, orbiting, I don't know, maybe uh, a few hundred uh, uh, stars or so. Um, that's not to say that the other ones don't have planets, but they're very, very optimistic. And they're assigning this uh, one, which is basically saying that 100% of the stars are actually going to have. All right, these, this is the number of planets uh, that can actually support life. So, um, these would be, uh, this would actually be the fraction of the, the planets that are actually going to be in the habitable zone. If you look at any particular star, depending on, on, on what, how, how hot the star is, the habitable zone, that's the zone where basically uh, we're saying life as we know it, that is that you could actually have liquid water. Temperatures will be such that you could have liquid water around that zone. That's what we're looking at here. It's all highly speculative here. Uh, so these are the planets that are actually the number of planets uh, that are actually going to be uh, in that zone. And this is the fraction of those uh, where life will actually arise. And here they just take the uh, position that if you've got all this chemistry taking place, given enough time that life is just going to pop out of that. So they assign a value of one, which I don't really, uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, particularly, but I don't say that anybody has any information to, to suggest otherwise. So maybe it's one, and very possibly it might be a number a lot less than one. Uh, the next one is uh, the fraction of those in which uh, intelligent, uh, intelligent life would actually arrive, uh, would actually occur. And uh, here they say uh, that if you're going to have life and it's going to be around long, for a long enough period of time, eventually intelligence is going to uh, occur because uh, that is something that would be evolutionarily uh, useful. Uh, but other people will argue that, look, on this planet, we only have one dominant, what we would really consider to be an intelligent species. So it's still questionable. 
So they assign a value of one uh, to that as well. Uh, the next one is uh, the uh, fraction of those uh, civilizations that are actually uh, going to uh, develop technology uh, in which they would actually be able to communicate, let's say, with the Earth. And again, uh, the authors use one uh, for that. That is, 100% of them would go on to do that. To, to, to do that. And the last factor here is the length of uh, time during which uh, detectable signals uh, would actually be produced. It's basically it's the amount of time that the civilization, the number of years that the civilization would be in existence. So there, they make the assumption that there'd be about a thousand uh, years per civilization. Of course, if the number, if that number is greater and a civilization lasts for a million years, uh, these things are all going to cancel out and give you one year. So that would say that they're, they're suggesting that in our galaxy there are a thousand uh, civilizations uh, that are intelligent, uh, life is developed, in, it's intelligent life, uh, they can send out electromagnetic information and that that information, uh, um, and, and, and they can receive electromagnetic information. So the idea uh, based on all of that, and again I think this is extraordinarily optimistic because uh, there's no reason, for instance, to assume that even if th this is equal to 1, that that number isn't, let's say, 10 to the minus 12th. So we really have no way of knowing that. Uh, the fraction that develop intelligent life might be, it could be 0. We don't really know. So we don't, we really have no, th th this is a really nice, you know, little equation to play around with the, Dr the Drake equation, but it doesn't really tell us anything. I mean, it's, it, it's just a way of making these kinds of, uh, of gross generalizations and estimates. It's interesting, but it, it just has to do with the uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, the SETI projects uh, that started out with the idea that, look, maybe there is something out there, so we're going to send a probe out into space, maybe somebody will find it. Uh, we actually sent uh, uh, Pioneer 10, uh, uh, a number of decades ago, and there was a gold plaque that was put on there, and if uh, some, uh, really, this is really a needle in the haystack kind of thing, but if some uh, extraterrestrial uh, uh, civilization ever uh, found the Pioneer spacecraft and they retrieved this uh, gold plaque, uh, they learned something about where uh, this, this craft originated, they'd get an idea of what we look like, because there's a picture of a man and a woman, scaled uh, to the size of the uh, spacecraft, so they'd know how big we were, uh, they'd know what we looked like, they might be able to figure out that we came in two different sexes, because uh, the man and the woman uh, are drawn differently, uh, they'd understand something about that we came from the third planet uh, surrounding our, our, our star, so there'd be a lot of information that they could get from that. Uh, we also uh, broadcast into space uh, uh, although we didn't do it intentionally to begin with, but we, uh, we sent out uh, radio signals in the AM uh, region of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, and that really doesn't, never leaves the Earth's atmosphere. It actually gets trapped by the Earth's atmosphere, but all of the FM signals uh, that we sent out, those have uh, made their way uh, from the time that the uh, uh, first FM transmission occurred, have made their way uh, out through the uh, universe, and uh, have traveled uh, during that period of time uh, some, I don't know, 40 or 50 or more uh, light years. So these signals uh, have uh, gone very far uh, into, the, uh, into the universe. But even if we look at um, the closest star to us, if we sent something out to uh, uh, Proxima Centauri, anything to Alpha Centauri, uh, or if we tried to reach Alpha Centauri, uh, traveling uh, at, you know, the, the, the the top speeds that we could actually travel at right now, I, I would say it would take us at least 50,000 years uh, to get to Alpha Centauri. Uh, uh, and if we wanted to get to our nearest supposed uh, technological neighbor and back, uh, that trip would take something on the order of about 600,000 years. So uh, we'd have to assume that if there was a civilization out there that wanted to visit us, uh, they'd have to have some, uh, some kind of a technology that would enable them to travel, uh, even traveling at uh, near light speeds, it would still take uh, uh, 200 years uh, for uh, a round trip communication. Uh, if you could travel, uh, if, uh, you know, it, it, or it, it, if a civilization lasts, let's say for a million years, and we'd expect there to be, let's say a million civilizations, 
and an average distance between them of 100 light years, uh, about 30 parsecs. So it would take 200 years uh, for a round trip communication, and that is for the um, for for what we're going to say. It's going to take 100 years for us to send the message to that civilization, and if they understand it and are able to send us back a reply, it'll take another 100 years uh, for the reply to get back. So we continue to look uh, for evidence of. Uh, uh, somebody trying to contact us. We continue to send uh, things out uh, into space. Uh, we use um, 20 centimeter uh, radiation, uh, what's sometimes referred to as the water hull. It's that area between uh, hydrogen atoms and what your book calls hydrox hydroxide or hydroxyl molecules. They're actually not molecules, they're free radicals. It's OH dot. It's not a molecule, it's a radical but the uh, 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 hydroxide uh, radicals uh, radiate near 18 centimeters. The uh, hydrogen atoms radiate at 21 centimeters, and it turns out that that uh, area right around, centered right around 20 centimeters is an area uh, where if we wanted to send a signal, uh, that's where we would send the signal. We'd assume that other intelligent people, uh, or, or not people, but creatures, whatever, would try to uh, lo listen in that area, and they would try to send us back uh, that same, in that same region because uh, uh, space is pretty much uh, uh, very permeable to that particular frequency. Nothing is going to absorb it, so that's uh, what we, what we, what, where we start looking. Project Phoenix is a large radio telescope at the National uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory in uh, uh, West Virginia, and it's used to monitor millions of channels in the 1 to 3 gigahertz uh, spectrum, that's that radio spectrum, looking for narrow, uh, perhaps one hertz transmissions that would actually be evidence of a signal of possible uh, alien intelligence. But as of right now, it looks like uh, so far that we are alone. Well, thank you very much for your uh, uh, extreme patience.